All right, gang, how we doing? Yeah? Not too good. Okay, that's real. That's real. New year, obviously. Welcome to 2021. It's kind of crazy. I feel like a lot of us, well, maybe not you, but me, we were kind of looking to like 2021, like what, just like get me to 2021, God. Let me put 2020 behind me. You know, new year, maybe a vaccine. We'll get this pandemic thing out of the way, go back to life as normal. And I had to catch myself because if I'm not careful, 2021 or a vaccine becomes my savior instead of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Jesus is the savior. He's been on the throne this whole time. Nothing's changed for him, right? He gets it. So yeah, new year feels great and it feels awesome, but we're not saved by getting to the new year. We're saved by Jesus. And so we're going to start a new sermon series tonight that's going to take us, at least by my plan, all the way through January and February, okay? Eight weeks of a brand new sermon series called Creed. Okay, creed is a Latin word. It means I believe. So question for you, just, you know, quick show of hands. How many of you would say, I believe in ghosts? Oh, okay. A couple of you, awkward, okay. All right, show of hands. How many of you would say, I believe in Bigfoot? Ooh, okay. Some proud Bigfoot believers. How many of you would say, I have at one point but no longer believe in the tooth fairy? Oh, see there, okay. Some of you are like, I still believe. Jury's still out on Santa Claus, so I'm not even going to touch that one because some people get really upset one way or the other, so I'm not even going to go there. But the word creed means I believe. I believe. I'm calling tonight's message the elephant in the room. All right? The elephant in the room. It's an expression. It usually means that there is something you cannot miss in this room, right? If you use the expression, there's an elephant in the room, you're like, there is something that is so awkward that nobody is talking about, but we can all feel it. You've been there? I've been there. The elephant in the room, and it reminds me of a poem. It's an old poem by a guy named John G. Sachs, and his poem is titled... The Blind Men and the Elephant. And maybe, you, maybe you're familiar with it or at least the story surrounding it, right? So I'm not going to read the poem, but uh, essentially six blind dudes encounter an elephant. I don't know how six blind men and one large elephant got to be in the same vicinity, uh, but nonetheless, six blind men got to be around an elephant somehow. One of the blind men he goes up to the elephant, and, uh, you know, he can't see, obviously, he's blind. He touches, like, the side of the elephant, like, kind of its belly. I think I've got a picture of an elephant. Is there, just so we have a good visual of what's going on, there it is. Okay. So, like, one blind man, he goes up, he touches the side of the elephant. He's like, wow, this elephant's crazy, sort of like a wall. Then the second blind man, he walks up to the same elephant, and he... He grabs a hold of one of those big tusks on the front. He's like, dude, you're so wrong. This elephant is way more like a spear than a wall. Are you kidding me? Third blind man goes up to the elephant and he starts grabbing the trunk. He's like, hey, this thing wiggles, it moves. It's not like a wall, it's not like a spear, it's more like a snake. Fourth guy goes up, he grabs a hold of the leg of the elephant. He's like... Hey, I felt some trees before. This feels like a tree. 
The fifth blind man, he grabs a hold of the elephant's ear, which I'm sure makes the elephant super happy. And uh, he's tugging on the ear and he's like, sort of like a fan. The last blind guy, you know, he's pretty skeptical of all these different descriptions of the elephant. So he makes his way to the elephant. He grabs a hold of the tail and he's like, you're all wrong. The elephant is like a rope. If we're not careful, each and every one of us can kind of do the same thing to God. Does that make sense? Each and every one of us, we approach God and we, we grab onto like one part of what God is like and then we're like, this is what God is like, I know now. But if you could only see, you could only really see, you'd see that there is a bigger picture that you're missing, that you are missing the fullness of what God is like. And this is exactly what happened in the early church. Like after Jesus died and rose from, the ga- rose from the grave and ascended into heaven, this is exactly what happened because the apostles now, they're going out spreading the gospel message all over the world, right? They're taking it to India. They're taking it into Africa. They're taking it into Asia, Northern Europe. I mean, they're going far and wide to spread the gospel. And as the message starts to get out there, people start injecting some new ideas into the mix to like, what is God like? Who is Jesus? What is the gospel? And they're not just new ideas, but they're actually wrong ideas that they start injecting, right? And these wrong ideas, we call them heresy. And so it became really important for the early church to reject the wrong beliefs and hold tightly to the right beliefs. In order to do that, the church met together, some important leaders, they had a thing called a council, and at these different councils, they started to form summary statements of what the gospel is, in order that everybody would be on the same page that they wouldn't be able to inject any false beliefs in there. And so they developed what's called a creed. And there are several different creeds. There's a Nicene Creed, there's a Constantinople Creed, but I'm going to base this sermon series for the next eight weeks around a creed called the Apostles' Creed. And some of you have probably heard it before. But what I love about the Apostles' Creed is it is basic summary of the key points of the gospel. Right? Key summary of these basic points. So I'm going to have the Apostles' Creed on the screen behind me. We're actually going to start off by reading this together. Okay? All right. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our theme for this whole year, you guys, if you remember back to the fall, is unshakable, right? That God is going to shake things up, and the things that are unshakable are the things that are going to stand. I believe that the best way for us, for you, where you're sitting in your context, at your school, in your friend group, in your family, with all of the things that you have coming at you, influences from outside, the way for you to remain unshakable is for us to dive deep into these basics. These things that every single 
Christian throughout history and around the world believes. Right? The things that all of us, no matter our opinions on other little doctrinal or theological issues, we all agree on these same things. And so for eight weeks, we're going to unpack that. Because as you were reading that with me, there was maybe a line or two where you're like, huh, I don't know what that means. That's great. We're going to talk about it. I promise. And so for tonight, we are going to start with just the very first statement of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Okay, everybody with me? Great. Okay. I'm preaching out of Isaiah 40 tonight, but this is a long passage. So I am going to need some help. So I need one, two, three, four people who are willing to come up. I have a microphone right here. You're going to speak into the microphone as you read this scripture for all of us. I'll be our fifth reader to round it out. So four people, who's coming up? One, two, three, four, Roman. All right, come on up. Okay, so maintain good social distance. Okay. So I'm going to have it up on the screen so that we're all reading the exact same version because I know a lot of us have different Bibles. I've got the New Living Translation tonight, which might be different than the Bible that you've got in your hands. So, London, come right here to this microphone. So leave it on its stand. No, no, no. So it's going to be on the screen. I want you to read what's on the screen. Does that work? Cool. Here, so pull... Squish the, here we go. Just keep it right on the stand. That's perfect. Okay, so John's going to have the scriptures up on the screen. If you're not one of these four people who are up here to read, get your Bibles out, Bible app or phone. Uh, You can just Google it, or if you've got a paper copy, I think that's best. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. For me, it's like almost dead center in my Bible. We're starting in verse 12. So, ooh, okay, so, London, I've got your section split into like two slides, so it's like two slides, two slides, two slides, two slides, that makes sense? And then I will pick up where we leave off and finish it out for us. So you're reading two whole slides of that text, you got it? Right now? Yep, right now. Okay. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? All right, Roman, you're up. So you got two more slides. Know for all the nations of the world are you but a drop in a bucket. They are nothing more than dust on, on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. All the wood in Lebanon's forest and all Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make the bird offering worthy of the God, our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes, they count for less than nothing, mere emptiness and forth, froth. Thanks, Roman. <laughs> to whom can come... To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. All right. All right, Nathan, you can squeeze the thing and pull it up so it's a little higher. There you go. 
Haven't you heard, don't you understand? Are you, you deaf, deaf to the words of God? The word he gave before the world began. Are you so ignorant? God set, sits above the circle of the earth. The people below him, yet below seem, seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and some and makes his tent from them. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish off all the way to the end of the chapter. So stay with me. It's on the screen. He judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. They hardly get started, barely taking root, when he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O oh, Jacob, how can you say that the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Wow. The subtitle in my Bible, and obviously the subtitles aren't scripture, but is, the Lord has no equal. Like, truer words never spoken. Like, reread that passage again, verses 12 to 31, and like, man, God is cool. And so here's like the big question I want to tackle tonight, right? Because we're looking at the first statement from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so the question that I want to ask and try and tackle tonight is who is God and what is he like? Right? Who is God and what is he like? I think in some senses, an answer to this question is literally impossible. Right? There's this quote that I found from uh, C.H. Spurgeon. He was a super famous pastor and preacher, um, and he said this. He said, This is a mystery which we must not attempt to fathom, for it is utterly beyond the grasp of any finite being. He's talking about God, who God is. As well might a gnat seek to drink in the ocean as a finite creature to comprehend the eternal God. A God whom we could understand would not be God. If we could grasp him, he could not be infinite. If we could understand him, he would not be divine. So I'm asking a really big question, right? Who is God and what is he like? In some respects, like Pastor Charles Spurgeon says, it's impossible to know what God is like. But the first line of the Apostles' Creed makes two statements about God. That God is the mighty creator and that God is a father. So I want to just look at those because the creed gives us those. And so while there might be some things about God that I will never fully be able to understand, I want to dig into these just a little bit. So look with me back into the text that we read, Isaiah chapter 40. And just start picking out all the language about God being the creator. The one who made everything. It's all over. If you find something that talks about God being the creator, shout it out. What's a line or a word or a phrase that you see in here? What do you see?
Verse 12, oceans. God made oceans. What else do you see? Come on now. I see a bunch of you have it in front of you. What do you see? Just shout it out. Shh, come on now. Go ahead. Made the heavens and the earth. What else do you see? Mountains and the hills. What else? Adam and Eve. Okay. It's not in this text, but it's true. What else? Fish in the sea. What else? Talks about the forests of Lebanon. Like think of giant cedar forests. What else? The ends of the earth. Let's dig into these a little bit. So the first one that I mentioned is that he holds the oceans in his hands. That seems kind of crazy. I need, I need a volunteer. I need somebody to help me out with something. Paige, you're right here in the front. I want you to stand right here. Bible says that God can hold the oceans in his hands. I wonder how much water can you hold in your hands? So turn this way so everybody can see you. Hold out your hands. And uh, I mean, you guys, God can hold the oceans in his hands. This is like a pitcher half full. Come on, Paige got it. Okay, ready Paige? Here we go. How's it going? Are you holding, are you holding it? Paige, Paige, are you holding it? Oh gosh. Troy, I'm so sorry. I'll clean this up, I promise. You guys, God can hold the oceans in his hand. Paige was struggling to hold half a pitcher of water in her hands. God is the creator of all of it. He can hold it in his hands. Look at just the next even line in verse 12. He holds the oceans in his hands. He measures the heavens with his fingers. Everybody go like this. How much is that? Like, stretch it out as far as you can. Like thumb to pointer finger. Maybe like four inches. God does this and he has the whole heavens right there. Says that he weighs the mountains on a scale. The only way for God to get the mountains on a scale would be to pick them up and place them on a scale. Right? I used to play football. That means I used to work out. I don't work out anymore. But at one point in my life, I could lift probably more than you currently weigh. That's not a lot, you guys. I wasn't that strong. But God could pick up the mountains to place them on a scale to be weighed. That's who God is. There's a cool line that, that Nathan read when he was up here reading that God can spread out the heavens like a tent. And you might just like miss that line if you were reading through the scriptures on your own. You might be like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. Who here came to the lockout back in October? Raise your hands. Okay, remember how cold it was, how windy it was, and we're setting up all of our tents. Do you remember how hard that was to set up your tent in the wind? Like some of you, you had a whole team of people. Some of you had your parents stay and help to put up the tents. You remember how hard that was? Back when I was in college, I went and I studied abroad in Israel. And, and one of the things that I did when I was in Israel was I went across the border into the country of Jordan. And uh, so southern Jordan, there's a, a desert and there's an area of the desert called Wadi Rum. And in Wadi Rum... I was living with a Bedouin tribe and we were literally living like the, the Israelites when they were wandering the desert for 40 years. So we would ride camels, get to a spot, 
we would unload all of our gear, set up our tents, and that's where we would be for the day. Then we would pack it all up in the morning, put it back on the camels, go to our next campsite. You guys, I've got a picture of one of these tents. So this is a goat hair tent in Wadi Rum. If the scenery behind you looks really cool, kind of looks like Mars, that's because it is Mars. If you've seen the, the movie The Martian with Matt Damon, this is literally where they filmed that movie, okay? So it's super cool, those giant rocks, desert sands, and we are living in that tent. There's a group of about 20 of us. That tent is about 60 feet long, and it's made from goat hair, and then the poles are just tree branches, and then we used like nails to secure the lines to the tent. You guys, it took all 20 of us and the Bedouin who were living with us to put up this tent, okay? When Isaiah is writing these words that God can spread the heavens out like a tent, he does it by himself. Isaiah is thinking about this type of tent. It's the same tent that they've used throughout all of human history. Goat hair woven into a giant tent that they put up with wooden poles. It took over 20 of us to put up this tent. God spread out the whole heavens like a tent and he did it by himself. God is the creator and he is mighty. Some of the other language in here, that he knocks down kings and presidents just by like his breath, like whoosh, gone. Like blowing out a candle, the greatest rulers on planet earth. Whoosh, says that he knows the name of every single star in the sky. I know like two, the sun and Beetlejuice. Right? God knows the names of every single star in the sky because he created it. This text in Isaiah 40 is filled with this language that God is the creator, that he is all powerful. Why does it matter to you? You're in sixth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade. You live here in the Southwest Metro of Minneapolis. You're coming to Grace Church. Why does it matter for you that God is the all-powerful creator? I'm going to give us four reasons why tonight. So if you're a note taker, this is going to be really linear and straightforward for you. You're going to follow along real easy, okay? Why does it matter that God is the creator, number one? The creator dictates how his creation works, okay? Note takers underneath that statement, write the word function. Put it in parentheses or something, all right? God dictates how his creation works, all right? The function. Okay, note takers, you ready for number two? Okay. Number two, the creator decides what his creation is for. Underneath that statement, write the word purpose. Put it in parentheses or underline it or something. The creator decides what his creation is for. It's purpose. Okay, number three. The creator determines what his creation is worth. Underneath that, write the word value. The creator determines what his creation is worth. It's value. And number four, the creator directs where his creation is going. Under that one, put destiny. Put in parentheses or something. The creator directs where his creation is going. So think about an earthly creator, 
right? There are a lot of earthly creators, artists, engineers, inventors. Think about um, maybe the guy who invented a hammer, okay? Or woman who invented a hammer. Honestly, I don't know. It was probably a really long time ago. So just think about the inventor of the hammer. The inventor of the hammer, they can, they can dictate to us how the hammer is supposed to function, right? How it works, how it functions. They can write the user manual for the hammer, right? They can tell you that you're supposed to hold on to this end here at the bottom and then you swing it with your arm and you hit something with the heavy end at the end, right? They can dictate to you the function of a hammer. This inventor of the hammer, they can also, like, they have decided for us the hammer's purpose. When they invented the hammer, right, they decided the purpose of the hammer would be for pounding nails into blocks of wood, right? That is the purpose of a hammer. Where'd my mic go? There it is. But the engineer, or the inventor, or the artist, right, this, this inventor of the hammer, what do they not get to do? They don't get to determine the value of the hammer. They might put it in a store, right, and the inventor of the hammer is probably super long time ago, so they're probably like, you can get one of my brand new, fresh off the line hammers for 20 chickens. Right? And you'd be like, that thing is not worth 20 chickens. I'll give you two chickens for it. And they're like, nope, it's worth 20 chickens. You'd be like, no, it's not. It's worth what I'm going to pay for it. Right? The inventor, they invent it. They can put a price tag on it, but its value is determined by what somebody's going to pay for it. Right? So this earthly creator, they don't get to determine the value of their creation. The inventor of the hammer... They also don't get to direct the, like, where the hammer goes. It's destiny. They don't get to say whether or not somebody in the future is going to misuse what they made. Right? The inventor of the hammer who made this tool so that you could pound nails into wood, they don't get to say you can never use it for anything other than that. Right? Right? People kill people with hammers these days. True story. Right? The inventor of the hammer is probably like, no, don't do that. They don't get to decide that. They don't get to decide if somebody's going to misuse it, that the destiny of the hammer would be for something other than a tool. This earthly creator who is not all powerful only can give the hammer a function, and a purpose. But God. God is all-powerful. God is almighty. The theological term for what God is, is omnipotent. Okay? It means he has all of the power. Literally all of it. And that's not even a misuse of the word literally. He literally has all of of the power. And so when God creates something, let's take you, for example. When God creates you, he is not limited like an earthly creator is limited. That means that God has given you a function, right? He made you to work a certain way with a certain personality, with certain giftings, with certain passions, God gave you a function. God also gave you a purpose. You're not just here by accident. You're not wandering aimlessly. Your life has a purpose to it. Because God, your creator, gave you one. And I said that an earthly creator couldn't ascribe value. That's because he's not all-powerful. God is all-powerful. That means he can give you value, and he does. A couple weeks ago. Remember I used the illustration of a $10 bill? Do you remember that? And I crumpled it up and I ripped it and I stomped on it. And you still wanted it. Because that $10 bill was valuable. Right? God, because he created you and because he's all powerful, gave you value. 
And there's nothing that anybody or anything can do to that value. You are inherently valuable. And an earthly creator, the earthly inventor of the hammer, couldn't give that hammer a destiny. God, who's all-powerful, he's omnipotent, he can give you a destiny, and he has. Right? He's determined your steps. He's created a grand plan for the universe, and your life fits into it. It actually matters that you're here. That's what having a destiny means. God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, he's dictated your your function, he's decided your purpose, he's determined your value, and he has directed your destiny. And that's only the first part of the first sentence of the Apostles' Creed. I haven't even touched on what it means that God is a father yet. But I honestly don't even have time to get into it. It would be its own message by itself. So come on Sunday, because in your small groups we'll talk about what it means that God is a father, but here's just a teaser trailer for you. Okay, the omnipotent God, all-powerful, almighty, who literally has all of the power, who spoke and galaxies were created, the one who can hold the oceans in his hand, the one that spreads out the heavens like a tent, the one who can pick up mountains and put them on a scale, that God loves you like a father. And for some of you in here, Saying that stings a little bit. Based on just the relationship that you might have with your earthly dad or complete lack of relationship that you might have with your earthly dad. I acknowledge that. Like I see you. I see that that hurts. I see that calling God father can sometimes be really hard for you. I see that. But God is not like your earthly dad. No matter how good or terrible your earthly dad is, God is the perfect father. And he cares about and he loves his children. And that is the heart of the gospel. If you guys come away with anything from tonight, what I want you to know is that the heart of the gospel The motor, the engine of the gospel is that God who created everything, the God who created you, loves you individually. He loves you. Not because of anything you've done, not because of anything you will do, not because you're so great. He loves you because he loves you because he loves you. That's it. Like a perfect dad does. And because God loves you so much, what's the end of that verse say? That he sent his only son. Because God the Father, the omnipotent creator of the universe, loves you so much, he sent Jesus to live the life you couldn't live, to die the death that you deserved because of your rebellion against God and to raise to new life, to conquer sin and death forever so that you could have a relationship with the God who loves you. That's the gospel. And so I'm excited to dig into the rest of the Apostles' Creed over the next seven weeks, you guys. We are going to tackle some really cool stuff. Like Go home and read the Apostles' Creed again. If you just Google it, it'll come up be able to see those statements, you'll be able to be like, ooh, I'm really excited for that week. I believe that God is going to do something in our midst as we go back to these fundamental basic truths of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so like always, if you've got questions that you're maybe like, I don't want to talk about this out loud, I'd rather like ask somebody anonymously, you can do that on Slido. Remember it's slido.com. Use the hashtag JHI, all lowercase, no spaces, 
That'll get you into this week's Slido, space for you to ask questions. You can see what other people are asking and upvote them if you have the same question. And then uh, if there's anything super pressing and interesting that you guys want to talk about right now, when we head upstairs to the J-High space, we can talk about that. Otherwise, on Sunday morning, before you guys go to small group, I always pull a couple questions. We talk about them. They're great questions to ask your small group leader. They're great questions to send to me in a text, whatever. Don't let your questions be the thing that keeps you from Jesus. Let's go after, let's go after answers. All right, so let me pray for us, and then we'll head up to the J-High space. I'll tell you what's next. Father God, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we worship you in this place because of who you are. God, thank you that you can hold the oceans in your hands when we struggle to hold even just the basic details of our life together. God, thank you that you spread out the heavens like a tent when we struggle to get things done. God, thank you that you can weigh the mountains on a scale even when our own lives seemed way too heavy for us to carry. God, because you are all-powerful, God, you can do what we cannot. And thank you that even though you are all-powerful, that you see us, that you love us like a father. Lord, I just pray, I lift up the person in here, God, who does not know you like a father. God, maybe they have a distorted view of who you are because of their own earthly father. And God, I pray, would you give them grace? Lord, would you meet them in that place and show them how amazing you are, that you are nothing like their earthly dad. Lord, and for the person who came in and is just so skeptical of you in general and who doesn't maybe even believe that you exist, God, by the majesty of your creation, when they look at the sky tonight, would they be able to see that you are real? Thank you that you loved us enough to send your son Jesus because it's in his name that we pray. Amen.